From the European Parliament in Brussels, this is Raw Politics. Thank you for joining us tonight, and this is what we have on the program for you. It's a date. Theresa May will come to Brussels Thursday to talk Brexit while vowing not to let Northern Ireland down. Brexit stress amid the political chaos, we hear how Brexit is affecting lives across Europe. Germany first, Berlin defends a new strategy to promote and protect its own companies. Venezuela split, fresh divisions in Spain over Europe's recognition of a new interim president. And Year of the Pig, meet the Chinese New Year's mascot with a secret political agenda. All right, it is time to meet our panelists this evening. We start with Darren McCaffrey, our political editor. Darren, what are you watching closely tonight? Well, you may not be aware of this, Tessa, but it is EU Industrial Day. What a... <laughs> Uh, what a date for your calendar, but Germany, in saying that today, have launched a new industrial uh, strategy. And you know what? It's all about putting Germany and potentially Europe first. Sounds terribly familiar. It does sound familiar, But it's it? all about trying to pump potentially state aids mm. into private companies to ensure that they do very well over the next decade Interesting. or so. All right, also joining us tonight, Renata Weber. She is a Romanian MEP who sits with the ALDE group. What about you, uh, Renata? Which of the stories are you watching very closely tonight? Well, equally Brexit and Venezuela. Brexit mm. because it affects us all, and Venezuela because I think it's a very, very dramatic moment. Absolutely. Big, uh, big moment in Venezuela, in fact. OK, and also joining us tonight, Lynn Boylan. She's an Irish MEP who sits with the Gwe NGL group. What about you? Which of the stories are you watching? Well, I'm Irish, so we're sure. all eyes is on Brexit and has been for the last two years. So, yeah, yeah so it's a Brexit for, for us at the moment. Doesn't look like it's changing anytime soon. All right, and that's where we're going to begin tonight, Brexit. Because UK uh, Prime Minister Theresa May is coming back to Brussels on Thursday to try and win some concessions for her beleaguered Brexit deal. Well, she'll meet with the EU President Jean-Claude Juncker and Michel Barnier to try to renegotiate something or anything on the Irish backstop. Well, Darren, uh, you were actually there at the midday briefing today. What, what, what did you get anything? Well, there's what, a little what do we bit know? of a row brewing over what <laughs> was said precisely yesterday by Martin Salmar, who's you now one of the most senior, the most senior civil servant inside at the Commission, and what he told British parliamentarians, British MPs who met with him yesterday about the legal guarantees they may well be able to give the European Union in regards to uh, Brexit and the backstop. Uh, he seemed to suggest, or this is what British MPs uh, suggested that he may be willing to give some ground on that legal uh, guarantee. Uh, and so he then also, though, issued a tweet uh, several hours later, seeming to deny this. And I was asking the question, essentially, who do we believe? Exactly. Let's have a watch. Yesterday, a group of British parliamentarians outside this building uh, said that when they met with Martin Salmeyer, that he had floated this idea of giving legal assurances inside the withdrawal agreement uh, linked to the Tusk Juncker letter that we saw uh, earlier on this year. That's what they said. Martin Selmar then seemed to issue a tweet uh, an hour or so later dismissing uh, this. Uh, who are we meant to believe? His tweets or, or those British MPs? As this was a meeting that would be likely to be misreported, I made sure that I had an SPP uh, representative in the meeting. And I can tell you that I am very well informed that what we have read in the Secretary General's tweet tweet is exactly what happened. I mean, that doesn't uh, answer the question still, though, because one side says there's the other. I think the reporters stand by what they reported, so... Yeah, indeed, and it was in the front page of the Times of London sure. today. Uh, I think what may well have happened, or what the truth may lie, is that Martin Selmar was trying to work out what would be needed to try and get the withdrawal agreement mm. through mm. Uh, the Westminster Parliament, and in doing so suggested that what you could do is have that letter that we saw last month from uh, Donald Tusk and from Michel Juncker insisting mm. that the backstop would only be temporary, to make that uh, essentially legal and put it inside the withdrawal agreement, would that be enough? It was an idea that was floated. Sure. But Martin Selma was trying right. to then backtrack yesterday, suggesting that it's not actually the policy of the European Union or it's not even what he is suggesting. Because we were, we were chanting before the show, uh, Renata, and uh, you, you know, I asked you what you thought about Brexit. What do you think? Legal guarantees coming from the EU, is that even a possibility? No, I think that in this moment, uh, the entire thing shows that there is a sort of a childish behaviour everywhere. It's very, very late. I'm really concerned with the fate of the citizens, both 
EU in, in the UK and UK in the EU. And uh, there is a sort of a stubbornness. I, okay, if we want to renegotiate a little bit, do we know what that little bit is about? Because that's the problem. Mm. We know that everything was blocked, but none of us will in fact make a move toward the, the other one. The British MEPs, uh, MPs would not change their mind. The European Union says, and I believe it is right, that we already conceded a lot. Mm. So where are we now? I'm afraid so that a no deal will be the... A no deal is what you no think. So, so Theresa outcome. May coming back here on Thursday, what on earth could she possibly bring with her that could change the direction? I mean, you've been, you said two, two years and still it's on the table. What could she possibly bring? Uh, nothing at this point. Uh, I'm not. I'm not trying to be to be funny, but I mean, we have a situation where it's Theresa May laid down red lines very early on in the negotiations, which is what led us to needing the backstop in the first place because of those red lines. They weren't prepared to negotiate on those red lines, so we have a backstop. Theresa May negotiates a withdrawal agreement, goes to her parliament, and then tells the parliamentarians to vote against the backstop. So I mean, she's any faith that we had in her, and I believe that she was going to stand over any agreement um, is null and void. So I don't see what she's going to come back yeah, with. But, but also it's notable that Leah Varadkar is here tomorrow. Sure. What's Leah Varadkar going to give? Because well, politics is about compromise. Yeah, and, and, and I think all the compromise has been given. We're, we're, and to well, the then, point well, then, where... So why does Leah Varadkar... OK, so the, I don't understand this. Like The British government have been very clear that they will not impose a hard border on Ireland. So who will? will you It'll be the European Union. Well, no, I mean, as, as Ireland they has said, they're not going to install a, 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 any infrastructure or hard yeah, but the, the EU, border. The, the only reason there, is, there would be a hard border in Ireland is to protect the EU single market. If the EU, but if, that's, what, but what that's, yes. that's when the backstop is triggered. Yeah, yeah precisely, but, but the whole point is Britain is perfectly, perfectly happy at the moment. Hmm. Even in the, of course the event it is, of no, we're wanting no, no, its cake no, but, and no, no, it. But even in the event of no deal, it says that we, are, we, we do not care about this land border. We are perfectly happy mm. to have the border as free and friction as it is. The only people who will impose a hard border in Ireland are the EU because they well, want to ensure the single that's 27 other markets. countries, isn't it? But that's 27 yeah. other countries who are looking and saying you cannot have the a, a intact single market unless you have checks and balances. So it's the EU who will impose a hard no, border. No, this is exactly... It this is. is. This is such childish politics of the British who want their cake and eat it. And they can't have it. I'm sorry, but everybody has watched the shambles yeah. that is Westminster and is saying, tell us what it is that you want. You keep telling us that there's other alternatives to a hard border, but we've had two years of looking at it and we yeah. haven't seen one example come forward that's actually practical. Okay. So it's okay. time for, I'm afraid, for the, the British politicians to just grow up and come forward with something that is actually tangible. I mean, we've talked about this uh, a lot, the Irish border and that backstop and that hard border. It is central to this Brexit debate. Theresa May, she was on tour today and this time in, in Northern Ireland where she pledged not to leave Northern Ireland behind and to find a Brexit solution without a hard border, as we keep discussing. Well, our correspondent Shona Murray is with the UK Prime Minister in Belfast uh, tonight. Shona, uh, so can you tell us what exactly did Theresa May have to say? What was her message there? Well, as predicted, uh, she sought to allay the fears of the business community, mainly here. That's who, that's the audience for today, essentially because, you know, last time Theresa May was in Northern Ireland, she was asking the business community to support her withdrawal agreement, which contained the backstop. And lar broadly speaking, when you speak to members of businesses here, retails, manufacturing, digital services, they do generally support the backstop because it is an element of security. It also allows Northern Ireland to remain within the single market and the customer Union and eventually have access to any of the trade deals that the UK does broker in the future. And of course, uh, not everybody thinks it's perfect, but they think it's the least worst option. And uh, they also think that the insecurity that's continuing, you know, particularly when it, it appears as if the UK could be hurtling towards a no deal scenario, that that's incredibly damaging. And I caught up with Connor Houston, who's a digital entrepreneur, and he explained to me that the balance needs to be right in terms of protecting the Good Friday Agreement and business. 
it's a bit of a conundrum and it's why this issue has proven to be so intractable. It goes back to the Good Friday Agreement, which recognised there are three sets of relationships. That is, relationships within Northern Ireland between the two communities here, relationships north-south between Northern Ireland and Republic of Ireland, and relationships between Britain and Ireland. And where, where the EU27 uh, and the UK have really found a, a, an intractable conundrum is that they can't find a solution that works with that arithmetic. And that's why the backstop, if you like, is the least worse option. Nobody's saying it's the best solution, nobody's saying it's, it's, it's the best fix, but if the UK is determined to leave the European Union, then there needs to be some way of protecting both the uh, internal market of the United Kingdom, i.e. between Northern Ireland and Great Britain, but also between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, where we enjoy over 300 areas of cross-border cooperation. So there you go, Conor Houston. I suppose he's really expressing the type of concerns and the consensus that I've been hearing when you speak to business people here in Northern Ireland. You know, very much so, they're also saying that we hear from the political side, you know, which tends to be tainted with an agenda, whether it's from one community or another. In actual fact, people here just want to get on with their lives and want to have a bit of security. Um, so Theresa May is, uh, you know, she, she's been speaking to, as I said, members of the business community. She'll speak to other communities this evening. Uh, but she's I would say received quite a frosty reception because there's an element of confusion about the fact that one minute she you know, supported a deal, supported the backstop, said this legal guarantee was necessary and then did a vault fast in the House of Commons and advocated for that deal to be rescinded. Um, tomorrow she's going to meet some of the Storbent members, the, uh, the five parties within Northern Ireland and she'll have a one-on-one -on -one with Arlene Foster where she expects that Arlene Foster will continue to double down on her position which is that they'll only have a withdrawal agreement once the backstop is deleted. She then again, as we know, moved on Thursday to Brussels after the Irish Prime Minister, Leo Radker, has been there. And it's hope, you know, she believes that she might get some sort of movement. Um, but when you speak to sources on either side, there really is no common ground at this point. Tessa. Right. Thank you for that. Uh, Shona Murray, our correspondent there. Renata, I'd, I'd like to go to you. So Theresa May there trying to appease businesses. Do you think any of that would make any difference at all? I don't know, in this moment, I, I remember that we discussed quite a lot and there was a lot of, of openness on behalf of the parliament to save the Good Friday Agreement, to keep the Northern Ireland. But can you keep them both in the UK that just decided to leave the EU and in the EU? Of course, this is a very delicate problem and I'm afraid that uh, in, in my view, it's too late. I know that politics is the art of the negotiations, but two years have passed and mm -hmm. I haven't seen that much willingness to negotiate. I mean, and is anyone even still listening to Theresa May, uh, considering how Brexit is going? And is she in any position to make any of those promises uh, that she's making to businesses? Well, Lisa, that's the crux of the problem is that you look at, at Westminster and there is no common ground for anything. Everybody knows that they don't want this withdrawal agreement, but they don't know what they do want. Whereas when you look in Ireland across the political divide, and it's not just with the Taoiseach Leo Radcliffe, all of the political parties are in agreement. There will be no hard border and we have to protect the Good Friday Agreement. Mm. You look at the EU, the 27 member states are s solid in their approach saying we have got this agreement, we've spent two years of our time negotiating it, we are now, this is where we're, we're finishing. So you're looking at Theresa May going like you need to find some sort of common ground, call an election, do something, but you cannot just continue to keep demanding that we pause everything and just keep negotiating with somebody who doesn't know what they're negotiating for. And, and, and uh, Darren, to your point earlier, what's so wrong about trying to protect, the, for, for the EU to, to try to protect their... their There's the, nothing the wrong, but it, I think it's wrong to suggest that, that the, the hard border or a hard border in Ireland would be a result of what the British would do. No, it is a result of Brexit, undoubtedly. Right. I mean, there are several things about this. First of all, and this is how complicated and complex uh, Brexit is. First of all, I mean, where we are, where Britain is, is a reflection of the fact that the referendum was 52-48 mm -hmm. and Britain is a divided country and it's not entirely sure where it wants to go. Uh, second of all, you know, people talk about backing the, and protecting the Good Friday Agreement. We've heard today from David Trimble, Lord Trimble, an architect of the Good Friday Agreement, someone who the Good Friday Agreement would not be in existence of were it not for him. And he's suggesting that actually the backstop is in contradiction of the mm. Good Friday Agreement rather than ensuring uh, that it uh, continues to exist. Um, but ultimately, you know, we are in a position where no one, and everyone insists on this, they do not want no deal. And that means that 
someone has to give. Well, some people are saying and, and, that's and if, not, if, if, it's, it's you know, not the Brexit bad is, Brexit thing is anymore. bad for Britain, it is also bad for a slowing German economy. It's sure. very bad for the Republic of Ireland. It's very bad for the people of Northern Ireland. And so in those circumstances, and they have to remember the vast majority of trade in Northern Ireland is within the UK single market, sure. not with the Republic of Ireland. Someone needs to give some ground. So it will be interesting. The most interesting meeting this week may not be Theresa May meeting Jean-Claude Juncker. It, it might be Leo Varadkar meeting, meeting Jean-Claude Juncker. Juncker. That's going to be interesting. Well, someone else has been making comments today about uh, Brexit, and that is a German Chancellor, Angela Merkel, because she has ideas on how to break the Brexit deadlock. And some believe that she has hinted at a compromise on the backstop, and that was yesterday. So let's take a look. Und es gibt bestimmt Möglichkeiten, die Integrität des Binnenmarktes, also die Geschlossenheit des Binnenmarktes, auch wenn Nordirland dann nicht mehr dazugehört, weil es ja zu Großbritannien gehört. Und auf der anderen Seite den Wunsch, ähm, möglichst keine Kontrollen an der irischen Grenze zu haben zwischen Nordirland und Irland, diesen Punkt auch zu lösen. Da muss man kreativ sein, da muss man aufeinander hören. Und ähm, solche Gespräche müssen und können getroffen werden. Das heißt, wir können die Zeit noch nutzen, um ähm, das, was bis jetzt einer Einigung im Weg stand, vielleicht, wenn alle guten Willens sind, noch zu einer Einigung zu bringen. Aber wir müssen von Großbritannien erfahren, das ist der entscheidende Punkt, wir müssen von Großbritannien erfahren, wie sie sich das vorstellen. I mean, I don't think anyone's going to disagree with what she said. Creative solution, a third way, no matter how you say it. But it is nice words. What does it mean? That's my question. That's my question. What is the creative solution? Nobody, in, nobody, in fact, has a solution in this moment, to be very honest. It would be good if they could sit and start it from scratch, but time is running out, so... OK, so no one knows the actually what that is creative, the creative <laughs> solution. <laughs> that is the okay. creative solution, because we've had two years of negotiations <laughs> with Britain laying down very firm red mm. lines. Okay. We don't like, my political party doesn't like the backstop. I mean, but it's the least worst option to preserving the peace on our island. And, so you and think this is the best solution This is the creative okay. solution. We've spent two years looking at it. I mean, lots of talks between politicians, but I mean, let's not forget that the people who actually bear the brunt of this will be, you know, People, ordinary citizens, bearing the brunt of all these political manoeuvring and basically the general Brexit chaos. And there are millions of people in Europe and the UK whose lives could be dramatically different come the 30th of March. Helen Malibur, and she is one of them. She is a British citizen. She's running a catering business in France. And Helen joins us now from Les Trois Vallées. Uh, Helen, uh, good to see you there. Thank you for joining us. I would like to ask you, what would be the biggest impact on your life and what is your stress level right now considering all the chaos uh, in Brexit? Um, the biggest impact for us um, would be the loss of freedom of movement. Um, we run a catering business. My husband's a private chef. I'm an outside caterer. Um, we work mainly in the Three Valleys in the winter. In the summer there's very little work here for chefs. And as a result, over the last uh, 11 years, we've worked throughout the EU in different countries, in Portugal, Italy, Switzerland, Greece, Spain, um, basically wherever the work has been. And that is half of our income. So how stressed are you right now? What's your, what's your life like right now? It's pretty stressful. Mm -hmm. um, every day you're, you hear new rumours, you're assured of new things, the following day it changes. So, yeah, it's... It's quite stressful. What, what are you more afraid of? The, all, the, all the political uncertainty that we're seeing or having a no-deal Brexit? Um, a no-deal no Brexit for us would be a cliff edge. It means on the basically 30th of March, we, we don't know what situation we're in. We don't have a continuation um, kind of, of rights, it, it stops. And then we're basically at the mercy of the French government and what they decide to do with us. You're talking about being at the mercy of a government, but then, you know, a lot of the politicians are bickering and talking about your future, basically. So what would your message be to politicians who were at the heart of this? I think all the options so far that have been explored with Brexit, it's taken two and a half years. Nobody can agree what they want. Nobody can agree what they voted for. I, I think it's, it's about time that they looked, that all the scenarios that so far have been presented are, are not beneficial for the UK, that they're not good for the UK. 
and I think it's about time it was uh, put a stop to, basically. Okay, so what is your plan now? Uh, what, do you, what do you plan to do? What's the next step? Um, we've applied for um, permanent um, card decisions, the resident, resident card, as we've been advised. When we went to collect them, we were only given a year's um, temporary card, not the full permanent card. Um, mainly because the year we set up our business, we earned less than the threshold amount, which means we can only get a temporary card at the moment. We're appealing that because we have five years previous to that that proves we were here legally earning everything that we should have been earning. And, and since, it's just that one year. Oh. Um, it, it kind of puts us in a precarious situation. We have looked into applying for citizenship. Um, we finally started the process of that in November. Um, for me, I have a chronic autoimmune illness, which severely affects my memory and my speech when I'm, when I'm ill with it. And the thought of having to apply for citizenship has been quite stressful with the fact that we have to sit an exam, we have to have an interview in French, we have to learn all the French history and be able to answer questions on that. And when I'm ill, I, I, that just wouldn't be possible for me. And tell in, last question, you wouldn't want to go back to the UK, would you? No, we, we've, point, set, yeah. we've set our life here. Everything is here. We have, obviously, we have family in the UK. We have friends in the UK. But our house is here. Our business is here. Every, we've set up to be here permanently. All right. Thank you for sharing your story with us. Helen Malibourne, they're talking to us Thank from you. France. Again, good luck to you. All right. So that's, you know, one of many stories. I think um, how Brexit is going to, to affect uh, the lives of people. Basically. Yeah. And it's interesting that, um, you know, in France, for example, unlike here in Belgium, you don't have to register. And actually, mm. British people who've been living there in some cases for decades are finding it quite difficult to prove that they've been there for decades because they never really thought they'd end up in this position of having to prove uh, that case. Uh, you know, the, the small little things, Tessa, that, you yeah. know, um, if you are a British person who lives in Belgium uh, and you've got a British driving licence, the British government are now telling you that it's probably best to apply for a Belgium. I mean, and, and I think even if we talk about, yes, rights will be protected mm. on a general scale, you have stories like these. How do you actually go about it in your, you know, just, in your just daily lives? My final lives, point was you know? that what we've okay. seen last week, though, is the EU offering visa-free free, travel yeah. for British citizens coming to the EU. Um, and Britain has already said that EU nationals will have... They, they can reciprocally stay in sure. the country, even in the event of no deal. I suspect to try and assuage people mm. out there that the same will be the case, that ultimately European countries will give British nationals who and currently live there, but then that they, they will be able to have permanent So residence. many questions are going to come up with every individual story. All right, uh, coming up on Raw Politics, we still have a lot more. You've heard it from Donald Trump, America first, but are some European countries following in his footsteps? That is up next. Plus, a piglet, once considered gangster, has become the mascot of the Chinese New Year. We'll take a look at how this cartoon made a comeback. We are not naive, we are traitors. We will not wait for the sake of it or compromise on our principles for a quick deal. OK, that was the EU President uh, Jean-Claude Juncker's message to the world that the EU were not naive free traders. Germany had an economic message of its own today while unveiling a new industrial strategy. The economy minister, Peter Altemeyer, said that Germany could buy stakes in German companies to protect under threat industries, blaming a, quote, uneven global playing field. Well, he said it can go as far as the state taking temporary stakes in companies, not to nationalize them, but uh, to run them in the long, not to run them in the long run, but to prevent key technologies being sold off and leaving the country. All right, joining me in the studio to discuss this is Swedish MEP on the International Trade Committee, uh, Christopher Fellner, who sits in the EPP group, and Reinhard Butikofa. He's a German MEP from the Greens EFA group, who is their spokesperson on industrial policy. And still with us, of course, is our political editor, Darren McCaffrey. All right, we, when we look at that uh, statement from, from Germany today, is this a significant shift towards protectionism? I'll, I'll start with you, Mr. Uh, hard to judge by now, but but I'm a little bit, you know, I've heard these things before. We heard it when I was new here 15 years ago. I heard Italy talking about national champions and, mm. and industrial policy. Ten, ten years ago, it was France, and now it seems to be Germany. But w with a country that is still the world champions of exports, I think the, Germany has a trade surplus of 250 billion euros and a trade deficit against China with 15 billions, you mm. know. 
it does seem to be a lot of fuss about what, what, what needs protecting? <laughs> yeah, and what, what do you think, Reinhardt? Is this a, protect, a step towards protectionism for Germany? No, it's not. Especially against China. We have to protect the future of our industry vis-a-vis -vis China and other strong players, but uh, that doesn't imply that we will opt for protectionism. China has that... not been playing fair in the global markets. To push back against unfair trading practices is not protectionism. But That's isn't just... that what buying uh, stakes in companies and giving benefits to well, industries are? Isn't that what protectionism is? Look, I have waited very long for the minister to finally come out with a statement on industrial policy. And I'm a bit disappointed that he made, uh, from my point of view, two major mistakes. And he, he ruined his own message, I, I would say. First, by pointing out this, what he called in his paper, the measure of last resort. And now everybody discusses about the German government buying into all kinds of companies, which is not the core yeah. topic. Mm. But, of course, that's a, a communication mistake. Okay. And the second mistake he's making is that he does not create an overall perspective of where we want to go. He looks at this from a defensive uh, point of view. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, if you, if you allow me a, a, a soccer uh, example, mm -hmm. by preventing your opponent from... Uh, scoring too many goals, you can avoid losing. Mm. Right. But without scaring your, scoring your so, own goals, you cannot win a game. So we should talk more about where we want to go with our industrial well, policy. Well, is Germany, well, Germany it's, first? It's, is that, is well, that a good... Is it, but just to pick up on that point, but then mm. isn't that in tie with what we've also been talking about over the last week, which is allowing companies to merge, European yeah. companies co to merge, to, to be to able to compete giants. on the global... Well, you have said stage. that uh, in the vast number of mergers, the European Commission has not intervened. And I think he said only 30 cases of intervention. Yeah. Mm. I would say that in order not to just pursue a dogmatic position, you have to be realistic and say, what is the relevant market? Okay. And just for the rail industry, in, but then the we have to... regional market right. is not the relevant market. But we have okay, to remember one seconds. thing, that, that we have 3.5 times as much investment in China compared to the Chinese investment in the European Union. We're still winning the game, so to say. But with that said, there are, of course, areas of concern, like technology transfers, like mm -hmm. cyber spionage. Forced that we should address. Transfers. Forced transfers. That we should okay. address, but not through protectionism. Let's, let, let's take this uh, a, a little wider, beyond, mm -hmm. beyond Germany, because Germany's move, it does come at a time of rising global protectionism. So the US and China, they're locked in a damaging trade battle that could, as some say, that could es escalate. And now the United Nations Nations is warning about the economic fallout from that. Pamela Coke Hamilton, she is the head of international trade for the UN Conference on Trade and Development. She's joining us now from uh, Geneva. All right, uh, Pamela, good to see you there. The UN report is is very gloomy. How bad is it really for the global economy? Well, in in several ways, uh, it if the tariffs go to 25 percent on March 1st, as as has been predicted the outcome will be significant. There will be significant macroeconomic impacts in terms of an economic downturn, especially due to instability in the commodity markets, as well as the financial markets. There will also be contagion and, and in terms of a reactionary effect uh, for other countries seeking to also defend themselves. The other and major issue that came out of our study, though, was that the diversionary effects will actually benefit Europe, which should make your panel very happy. Um, there will be a $70 billion um, a diversion to, to Europe, um, and in addition, a $90 billion uh, diversion on um, the value chains that will be diverted from, from China. Um, in addition to which, we will also have uh, East Asian um, value chains decreasing by about $160 billion. And the transference of the system in terms of the multilateral trading system will be extremely negative. I also wanted to pick up one of the points that your panelists made, that uh, the protectionism is going to be a problem. And there is a global rules-based dispute settlement system that's currently being crippled by the failure to appoint appellate judges uh, to the WTO dispute settlement body. Um, so 
actually moving towards protectionism, and I had quoted Cordell Hall yesterday, is that prohibitive protective tariff is a gun that recoils on ourselves. It doesn't work, and it hasn't worked for the United States, and it won't work even if it goes up to 25 percent. Uh, in fact, the loss to the U.S. will be significant, right. and the diversion away from China will also be significant. Thank you for your insight there, Pamela Coke hamilton there. Um, so what Pamela was saying, in fact, uh, with the trade war between the U.S. and China, the, the EU is inadvertently winning, uh, is gaining, is gaining from this, but Come still on. it's not something... No, exactly. okay, you, I don't believe it. You don't believe second. it. No. I mean, this is just... This is just uh, sort of looking at numbers without looking at politics. Yeah. BMW exports from the U.S. to China. Mm. If they go to, uh, to a trade war, BMW will suffer. But then yeah. the EU so, can, can but, pick up. Yeah, but, 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 Come but, 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 on. But also, okay. there's going to be a faltering global economy. So exactly. we, you, sure. you have okay. to factor in the I fact mean, that, you know, if China and the United States genuinely go to a trade war, it essentially the global economy is going to slow, potentially going to recession. That is not going to be good for so Europe. I suppose, yeah, so exactly I suppose the point she was making is that it's in the short term, that those, those that will be left, uh, you know, to be picked up in the but market... But if we only look at the short term, then we're all out of it. Because, sure. you know, these are the two biggest markets for Europe. If they go bust, then... We're out of business. A trade war, as somebody compared it to two people standing in front of each other, hitting their own head, hoping that the others pass out first. And I think that's the problem we see with this conflict. It's China and the US that are losing. Relatively speaking, we're not hitting ourselves yet. Sure. Therefore, we're winning, but it's not a way to win for the world. But I think what is also interesting is, just picking up on what you mm -hmm. said, I mean, what lots of what you said initially is what Donald Trump has been saying. Sure. That the, 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 the global playing field is not level, uh, that China has been and distorting you the need rules. To fight back. And that ultimately, you know, what Germany have announced today might not be protectionism, but, you know, it's on the way to protectionism. No, it's not. And I think it's, it's complete ideological nonsense to ignore reality and just uh, label everything that is be changing as protectionism. I mean, realities are changing. 30 years ago, China was not an industrial yeah. giant. Today it yeah. is. We have to accommodate to the fact that they have an industrial policy. The mm. U.S. But we need to, but okay, we need to protect policy. ourselves yeah. against China. Well, of do course it. you have to protect if they don't play a fair game. But remember what are you going to do? Open uh, okay, the I'll give door? You the last word, Christopher. Christopher. Okay. I've spent Christopher. 15 years doing trade policy in Brussels, and I haven't met a protectionist yet. At least nobody that's claimed to be a protectionist, but I've met a, a lot of people claiming they want to protect X, Y, Z. And in this area, we have to remember that what we are up to are probably more of security issues and, and you know, security policy than trade policy. So let's not be naive when it comes to cyberspionage and other things like that, but let's not resort to protectionism and trying or, to close okay, our so borders. I probably no. would disagree with that. OK. No, you know, what I is mean, protectionist, you, what you is protecting your industries? Right. A realistic discussion mm. should be on the terms of whether FDI screening, for instance, would be justified under security concerns. Okay. But it's interesting. Right, we are out of time. Just we are out of time. When it's getting interesting, that is just as always. a mess. <laughs> we knew. It's a very interesting uh, conversation here. All right. Well, in addition to a split over trade, and there are fresh divisions in Europe over another topic. It's uh, more political now. It's over Venezuela. Alex Morgan and our team in the Cube have been looking into this story. Alex, tell us about this. Indeed, we have Tessa here in the Cube, alongside uh, Emmanuel, Shauna, our team. We've been looking at the developments when it comes to Venezuela. Yesterday, talking, of course, about a domino effect of several key European countries recognizing um, Juan Guaido, the opposition leader, as the interim president. Key in all this, though, and this is really important, there was not a joint EU text. Why? Because Italy vetoed it. The divisions in Italy over whether Mr Guaido could be recognised or whether that's a coup, that divided the government there and meant the EU couldn't agree on it. And in fact, actually, the co-chair of the uh, Council on Foreign Relations in the EU, Carl Bildt here, saying that he thinks that the EU should now scrap this mechanism whereby every country has to agree before they can sign off on something to effectively allow uh, the EU to make foreign policy decisions like this. It was effectively gagged yesterday by this veto from Italy. But it's not just Italian politicians who've had a real problem with recognising Juan Guaido. Look at this hashtag that's been going around in Spanish, uh, not in my name. A huge number of Spanish politicians tweeting this, 
to say that they do not recognize Juan Guaido as the interim president, calling uh, some of them going as far as calling it a coup, what is going on in Venezuela. Other hashtags here as well, hands off, no to war. A lot of these hashtags, but key is that uh, Spanish one there, not in my name. And indeed, a great number of uh, MEPs, 39 in total, signed a letter. A letter to uh, the president of the European Council, presidency of the EU, basically to all the EU bodies, denouncing the decision, or the call anyway, among EU nations to recognise Juan Guaido. I just want to pull up a couple of quotes from it. And they, these 39 MEPs from uh, three political groups right across Europe, say they condemn any expression of support provided to the ongoing coup attempt in Venezuela. Compare that to the language you were getting from the foreign secretaries of the UK, of Germany, the president of France. Very different language. And also here they are saying the actions of the, these European countries are deepening the risk of foreign military intervention costing the lives and suffering of Venezuelans. 39 MEPs saying to the EU, abandon support for Juan Guaido. It is clear, divisions right at the heart of the European Union. Not only was Italy not signing up to the text, but the MEPs just condemning the idea, 39 of them, condemning the idea the EU could put any weight behind Juan Guaido. Many of them saying, not in my name, Tessa. All right, thank you for that, uh, Alex and our team in the queue. I think what's interesting there is when issues come up and show the divisions that exist within the EU, or is that absolutely normal, no, to have just different opinions? I mean, remember one thing, 10 times as many MEPs voted differently last sure. week here, actually. And, and mm. you know, those people, they were saying probably exactly the same thing when Lech Wałęsa was ending communism in Poland and Václav mm. Havel did in Czechoslovakia. But they were on the wrong side of history then, and they're on the wrong side of history again. Okay. Yeah, well, people do ask the question, if, if, if this is viewed as a coup, I mean, is Maduro's election viewed as open and fair and free? Yeah, sure. I'm uh, not entirely wording sure. Wording certainly uh, important here. All right, well, coming up uh, on Raw Politics, a lot more. Is Brexit the best thing to ever happen to the Europeans? Uh, Unity, a right-wing party in Sweden, is also backing down from its pledge to Swexit, the EU. Is Brexit chaos the reason? Do stay with us for that. back to our politics. Now, the uh, far-right uh, Sweden Democrats, they're changing their stance on the EU. After campaigning earlier this year on leaving the bloc and calling for a referendum on the issue, party leader Jimmy Ackerson now says Sweden should stay and shake up the institution from within. Ackerson said, and I quote, cooperation is needed to achieve results and it is through collaboration that opportunities for reforming the EU from the inside are improved. And he also said, when other parties try to portray the Sweden Democrats as a protectionist and closed party, it is a false image only intended to distort and smear the Sweden Democrats. We see the benefits, not only the disadvantages of today's EU cooperation. All right, joining me in the studio now to discuss this, we have Stephen Wolf. He's a British independent MEP. And we also have Jan Zaradil. He's a Czech MEP with the European Conservatives and Reformist Group. And still with us is Dan McCaffrey, our political editor. All right, what do you think is really behind this U-turn of Jimmy Ackerson? Now he's talking about cooperation and collaboration. Well, I think one of the key objectives of the Brexit negotiations from the European Union's perspective was to make sure that any country that considered going down the line of uh, the UK and having a Brexit, a Swexit, a Lexit, an Irexit, was informed that they would be incredibly difficult to go, you would make your life a misery, and well, that's, exa a hard negotiation. And that's exactly it is what they've that's exactly what they've done. So it's job one achieved mm -hmm. by the European Union. And I think that is one of the key points that we can take from this process. And so what you're seeing with the Swedish Democrats is them taking stock of what happened mm -hmm. with Marie Le Pen when they had her campaign and looking at this process and saying, at this moment in time, whilst Britain is deemed to have a bad deal, then I don't think it's in our interest to actually go down that same line. However, mm -hmm. that's politics of today. In a couple of years' time, when you see that Britain is succeeding, we're doing very well, <laughs> jobs are still going, yeah. I think you'll start to see a different stance because the European Union's economy will start to decline again. Well, that is something that uh, we will have to wait and see. I mean, I mean Jan, what, what do you think? Is, is this just an act of desperation on, on, on their part? You know, and they say trying to change from within. Do you believe that? Look, they are already members of our parliamentary group. Uh, we have two Swedish Democrats as members of the ECR group. 
And the policy of our group has never been to leave the European Union. There is no party, no ECM member party, that would promote a programme uh, designed to leave the European Union. But the Sweden Democrats, they campaigned for that, and people probably yes, voted but, for them on that point. But so we, we mm. agreed on a very close cooperation. We expect them to join our group after 2019 elections. And I think that from their point of view, it's much more beneficial for them to be part of a Euro-realistic uh, mm. mainstream, so say, which wants to reform EU from within, than to come with pretty much unrealistic scenario to leave the European so, Union. So, in fact, the question we were asking before the break is that, do you think, is this actually the best thing, Brexit, the best thing that happened to the unity of the European Union? Because it would dis, you know, dissuade people from actually leaving. So, I think, I think there are several things here. I think political parties like the Swedish Democrats and Marine Le Pen, to a degree, are having to reflect actually the view of the public. They're following rather than leading, because, as Stephen has rightly pointed out, people are looking at at Brexit and thinking, mm. you know what, if the second largest economy mm -hmm. that's not in the Eurozone can't leave and it's easy, then how can someone like France leave or indeed a much smaller uh, nation? And I think we've now got to the point where the Eurozone, with a Eurozone country, I mean, it would be almost impossible unless the whole thing fell apart for them to leave. But is it good for the European Union? I'm not entirely sure it right. is. And you can make this point. You can make the point that Britain's been the naughty boy, mm. the kind of grumbling teenager, and actually, you know, to have them out of the room so you can have deeper European integration, that would okay. be good. But I think Britain has been a kind of equilibrium to France, which yeah. Germany okay. has very cleverly leveraged from time to time, because clearly Britain is much more free market, much more of a liberal economy, um, and, and Germany yeah. have used that leverage sometimes okay. against the Franco-German relationship. Yeah, what do you want to say? Uh, because... You said, uh, you put a question whether Brexit, in fact, is the getting uh, European Union the... more yeah. united. Yes. I wouldn't say so. I think that there will be still a great discrepancies between and amongst individual political streams within the European Union. Mm. We, of course, for instance, we uh, deny and, and we reject this uh, uh, federalist stream, which is represented by mm. the European People's Party and by socialists and by liberals. And we would be happy if we are joined by more parties that do not want to leave, do not want to dismantle, do not want to destroy, but do want to reform the European mm. Union. Destro OK, fine. I, because I just want to raise uh, the point uh, that raised that he said that you want to reform from the inside. Is it reforming, changing European from the inside or tearing it apart? I, I think it's very difficult. I, I, I appreciate Jan and, and, and his party and those within there because there are very decently thinking people about the difficulties and problems of the, of, of the Eurozone. The Euro is definitely a currency that is damaging countries on the periphery and it's mm. helpful to those in the centre. But you're going to have a unified army, you're going to have a European UCB, you're going to have a unified central corporation my, tax, the CCTB. My so country. my question Question is, my question is to yourselves, is you're all saying we want to reform, but the movement, the train is going down the ladder. Well, I tell How you, can you stop I tell something you, that's my going country down the is not part of the Eurozone. Mm. Sweden is not part of the Eurozone. Agreed. And one of our slogans in the electoral campaign will be that we want to turn European Union from one currency union to multi currency union. Mm. This is, I'd love I to think, see that. This I'd is, love I think, that. a very strong slogan that I would, uh, I would say. But, 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 but it's something you would change from yeah, there. Right. I mean, I, okay, I last point, Darren. I, I don't see how you can say you're against European integration and be an active member of it's the like European Union. It's like having your cake and eating it, 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 it too, isn't like, it? You know, it, I mean, take a leaf out of Protestantism. I mean, okay. at least they had... Uh, they broke away from the Catholic Church for a reason and made sure. a success of it. Uh, you know, remaining inside, you're going to tinker at the edges, I think. All oh, right. OK, longer discussion needed there. All right, let's uh, head now to somewhere far away. Let's go to China, where an unexpected character has found herself at the centre of New Year celebrations. Let's take a look. Welcome to China, the communist-led country, which is today welcoming in the Year of the Pig. And playing a central role, Peppa Pig, the British cartoon character with a controversial past. Just last year, she was denounced as, quote, gangster by Chinese authorities, a threat to Chinese characteristics, even removed from social media and a crackdown against subversive content. Hogwash, say Peppa fans, who seem to have won this war. More than just a comeback, you could say this dissident swine is hogging a Chinese New Year.
Well, there you go. Stephen just said that he watches every episode. Seen every episode. <laughs> right. Every episode. All right. Well, coming up uh, on Raw Politics, we want to hear from you. How is Brexit changing your life? Well, stick around in the next hour for your chance to call in and tell us exactly how it's affecting you. Contact information is on your screen. You can call us at 0800-3333-7002. Email at rawpol at euronews.com. And join the debate on social media. Look for us on Twitter, Facebook, and use the hashtag Raw Politics and our lines are all open now. Welcome back to Raw Politics. Now, you've heard from everyone on our panel. Now, we really want to hear from you. It's your turn. Uh, your call is right after this program. And this is how you can get in touch. There's so many ways to get in touch with us. So you can call us at 0800-3333-7002. Email at rawpoll at yournews.com. And find us on Twitter, Facebook, and use the hashtag Raw Politics. You can find us on Skype. And you can also look for all of us and search for our names. And uh, the information is there as well. And joining me now here to discuss uh, this is the Stephen Wolf. He's a British independent MEP. And we have our Brussels correspondent, Maeve McMahon, joining us. And of course, our political editor, Darren McCaffrey. And what do we always say? It's, it's a free, free number. It's a free <laughs> number. So you've got to call. <laughs> and here are the questions that we want to ask you and want to hear from you. So we're asking, how is Brexit changing your life? Now, also, does Europe need a basic income? Because, you know, Italy has just introduced this uh, measure. And is Germany right to put itself first? So these are the three questions that we want you to call us in about. We want to know what the people of Europe are saying. All right, so let's quickly discuss uh, what, what these questions are. Darren, uh, Brexit. Brexit is changing people's lives massively. Yeah, it is. And there are three million people in the United Kingdom who are EU citizens. Uh, there are millions of British citizens who live elsewhere in Europe. Um, and there are questions about what does their future hold? You know, governments say they want certain things and mm. people hope for things if deals go through. But ultimately, these are people's lives. Many people have lived there for decades. And there is an awful lot of uncertainty. Yeah. There's a good chance tonight to actually err that uncertainty. And tell us and how it is affecting you. Tell yeah. us affecting you and... Um, and hopefully people will listen. But I think generally there are lots of worries, huh? There are lots yeah. of worries. There and are I think we're going to get a lot of calls on that because so many people's lives have been impacted by and, Brexit. And the second question on Europe's uh, the, the, the basic income, because I think there's 780 euros in Italy, uh, correct, that they are giving to people of a certain in income level and those without jobs. So per month. Absolutely. As of March, that will be introduced. People obviously can apply for it if they deem themselves poor or unemployed. And that will come along with job training as well. So tonight we're asking you, do you think Europe needs a basic income. Yeah, so that's, that's a real good conversation that. it is, starter. It is, because, uh, you know, very interesting. And earlier today in the panel, we were talking about Germany uh, putting itself first, you know, from America, America first. Um, is this, uh, uh, is, uh, this is a question we want to know if people think Germany should be putting itself first. Exactly, based on what we were we had earlier on the show. What do you think, politics, Stephen? Yeah. I think Germany's been putting itself first in the whole period of the <laughs> Well, European, there you go. That's European, one opinion. European what do you Union. think? And I can't disagree. If UK's going first with Brexit, America first, why not Germany as well? Yeah, well, that sense, it go. is that sense of protectionism. Are each it country is. now putting their own self national Yeah, I mean, we're talking about the you know, definition yeah. of what is protectionism, what is just taking care of your industry. All right, again, we want to hear what you have to say on all those questions. Our team is standing by to take your calls. So there are lots of ways to get in touch with us. So call us 0800 7002 Email on your screen. It's at rawpoll at euronews.com. Find us on social media. Look for uh, Maeve, Darren, I or Stephen, and you will find all that information. That um, <laughs> and yeah, do get on that phone. And we want to hear what you have to think and uh, have to say on all those questions. And we'll also be on Facebook Live, so feel free to participate right. on Facebook too. Absolutely. So we have time for tonight's raw moment. It comes from Turkey, uh, where President uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan has launched a fiery attack on the EU over its position on Venezuela. Let's take a look. Avrupa Birliği'nde ne oldu ortaya çıktı? Hani demokrasi? Nedir bu zillet? Bir taraftan demokrasi, demokrasi, demokrasi diyeceksiniz. Sandık, sandık, sandık diyeceksiniz. Ondan sonra da cebren ve hile ile kalkıp hükümet devireceksiniz. Well, strong words there from Erdogan about uh, intervening. Intervening, I mean, he says, in Venezuela. This thing about uh, Erdogan, who one might say is not the greatest fan of democracy, lecturing the European Union on democracy, uh, to a country where, as I say, Maduro's elections, I'm sorry, last year, were not free, fair and democratic. Um, whatever you think about whether you think 
this is a coup or not, you cannot say that the current well, president go. is there through free and fair elections. As you were saying, uh, don't forget, uh, we have a lot, of, a lot of things to talk about uh, tonight. Uh, so we want to know what you think on all of the questions that we were asking you earlier. So do join us for your call after the show. Good night.